Hey ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Reese. I just wanted to make a video that kind of explains a little bit more on what we're doing today uh, when you are at, actually at home. So today we're gonna be talking about what is considered a Renaissance man. So when it comes to the Renaissance, like as we know, it's this rebirth of ideas and ways of thinking and all the different ways to do things around uh, the around the world and in Italy and everything. So when it comes to that ideology, we have like what we consider the ideal Renaissance man. Okay, so again, we are in this patriarchal society um, and they deal mostly with men. Now, what is a Renaissance man? And this is actually where this graphic organizer comes into play. So what you're gonna actually put in the part that says then is what I'm going to actually explain right now. So what a Renaissance man actually is, is that it is a man who actually knows a whole lot and is an expert in a whole lot. They're kind of a jack of all trades, if you want to call it that. All right, so when we talk about different people, we can talk about, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. He was an inventor. He was a painter. He was someone that worked a lot with uh, uh, um, astronomy and you know, anatomy of the human body and different things along those lines. Just a whole slew of just different things that he was an expert in. And that's what you can actually put in the part that says then. Now, I do ask you guys to actually find a picture of someone who could be considered a Renaissance man. So you can put a picture of Leonardo da Vinci if you want. You can find an image of Michelangelo. And you can find, you know, a picture of just another Renaissance man. Now, this ideology of like a Renaissance man has been transferred throughout all of time and even is something that we see today. All right, so when it comes to now, is it possible to actually be a jack of all trades? Or is it more possible to be someone who, you know, is just an expert and just a, a couple of different things, you know, not just a slew of different things, but just a couple. All right, so when it comes to like now, like what I would describe as a Renaissance man now is someone who actually is, you know, helping society through like a specific area. All right. So like people like Elon Musk is like a person that I think of. All right. Bill Gates is a person I think of. So like they're, they're definitely in the technological side of things and they're helping out society in that sense of the fashion. Hence why I think that they would be considered Renaissance man. So you guys can put that description down there. All right, and then you can find an image of somebody that you consider a Renaissance man. Now, to kind of help yourselves out a little bit more on what this idea of a Renaissance man actually is, I actually found a nice song to kind of help you guys out with this. So I'm going to actually just mute myself and I want to press play on this. So give me a second. Oh, okay. 
Renaissance man Working for Henry VIII Writing Utopia A perfect as a place Shakespeare's plays told of the days of Romans and Danish kings Hamlet and Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet on the summer night's dream Renaissance man The part of the London scene Renaissance man All right, so obviously just something that's a little bit more fun, but you did get a couple of examples of what Renaissance men were back in, you know, the uh, 1300s and 1600s. So uh, moving on past that, we're actually going to read a primary source from one of the uh, most major of the Renaissance men, a uh, person by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli. All right, so he lived from 1469 to 1527. All right, he wrote his big, very famous primary source called The Prince. Now, when it comes to this, um, it is a very, very uh, important source that a lot of uh, political people actually use still today. Um, but when it comes to this, we have to have a little bit of background contextualization. So if you forget what contextualization actually is, I use that term a lot. Uh, basically what um, contextualization is, it is the background information that, you know, you just need to know before you actually get into what you are actually reading about. Um, kind of the best way to describe it, it's like the Star Wars crawl. Um, you know how like Star Wars movies, they have that like big crawl that tells you like what's happening in the world and before you actually watch the movie. Same thing when it comes to the background contextualization. So what I want you guys to do here is that I want you guys to read this first couple of paragraphs, all right? Really, really small, a couple sentences per each paragraph. What I want you to do is that I want you to find main ideas that are going to be important for you to understand before you actually read the primary source that goes over the prints. All right, so like when it comes to this first paragraph to kind of give you an example of what to do, all right, this says Niccolo Machiavelli lived in Florence, Italy during the Italian Renaissance. He was born into a family of, of minor Italian nobles. He received a good education, but feared his low rank would prevent him from attaining his goals. Okay, so one big thing that I would definitely put here is that Niccolo Machiavelli lived in Florence, Italy during the it Italian Renaissance. All right, that's very important to understand there. Um, and then on top of that, I would say that um, he feared that his low rank would prevent him from attaining his goals. Okay, to kind of give you an idea of his motivations. So those are two main ideas that we get from just the first paragraph alone. alone. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you guys to actually uh, spend time uh, reading through the rest of this to actually um, get it. So, um, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Pause the video right now. I'll see you in like five seconds. All right, so hopefully that you guys have done that. Um, I'm going to move on to the actual primary excerpts. Okay, so we have three quotes that we're going to be looking at today from the prince. Now, when it comes to this um, primary source, a little bit more background information that you guys need to know about. And you guys read a little bit about it already, but... He tries to answer the question, uh, to be a good ruler, would, would you rather be feared or would you rather be loved? Okay, and that's something that um, is kind of a big uh, debate now even. Okay, so a little bit more applicable to today's society, especially with like what's going on today. All right, so that is that. Now, uh, moving on, what I want you guys to do is I want you to spend time actually reading all three quotes so that you guys understand when we get to the questions. So pause the video and read all three quotes right now. I'll see you guys in five seconds. All right, so hopefully you guys have read each of these quotes. All right, so when it comes to the document-based questions, I kind of go over it. Um, you'll notice that it says explain. All right, explain, explain, explain. All right, so when it comes to 
this idea of explanation, like, I don't want to just sit there and give you guys a bunch of, and say, like, hey, write four sentences over this. All right? We all know what's going to happen. You guys are just going to find a way to make four sentences, and that's it. I would do the same exact thing. So we're going to be a little bit more, um, let's just say, intentional in what we're trying to write here. All right, so we're going to actually use a um, acronym, and you guys have actually may have heard this already, but that acronym is ACE. Okay, so you want to ace your writing the whole entire time. So the first thing that you guys want to do is that you guys want to answer the question. All right, answer the question. All right, so you're going to like literally sit there and answer the question. All right, so the question is, do you agree with uh, Machiavelli when he asserts in his book, The Prince 1513, that it is better for a leader to be feared than loved? All right, so you're going to answer the question. Yes, I agree with what uh, Machiavelli says in his primary source. You can also disagree. It doesn't it doesn't matter to me as long as you are uh, you know stating an opinion here. Okay, so that's the first part of this. Now the next thing that it, we got to do is actually cite evidence from one of these quotes, all right? So we're going to cite evidence from one of the quotes. So I wanna tell you guys right now for this first one, I would go back to quote one, all right? So when it comes to this, all right, we can actually go down to the part that says um, this right here. So we're gonna say the ruler will have greater security in being feared than in being loved. People are less concerned with hurting someone they love than someone they fear. Love endures through a bond uh, which people being scoundrels will break whenever it serves their advantage to do so. But fear is supported by the dread of pain and punishment, which is always present. Okay, so, so to kind of just like summarize that a little bit more so you guys understand it a little bit better. Um, basically like this idea of like love and fear um, people that like rule by love, all right, the people like are going to, you know, break that bond whenever they seem fit. Like, yeah, everyone goes through a breakup, all right? Um, so like the idea of love, like isn't as strong as the idea of like being punished, okay? So like think of your parents, like you do things or you don't do things because your fear of punishment and dread of pain or punishment or whatever you want to call it. All right, so that's basically what he is trying to say here. Okay, so I'm not going to quote this. I'm not going to take it and just copy and paste it. We, we're a little bit smarter than that. So I want to say something along the lines of, you know, um, in his, in the first excerpts, all right, or, the, or in quote one, let's do that. In quote number one, uh, Machiavelli talks about how um, pain and punishments is a fear that all people have and will obey because of that fear. If a ruler loves their people, then the people will break that bond whenever they see fit. So that's a little bit more of the cited evidence. I just uh, kind of uh, explained it a little bit of the quote that I was using. Um, the one thing that I would definitely put though, like this first part, say like in quote one, in quote two. So like when I'm reading it, I can sit there and I can go back and be like, okay, he's talking about quote one. All right, or she's talking about quote one. All right, so that is that. So we have answered the question now. I want to underline this. And we have cited evidence. All right. Now, the last part is elaborate on your evidence. Okay. Or explain your evidence. Elaborate is just a fancy word for explain. Okay. So... What I want you guys to do is that I want you to always say, to start off this part saying, this shows that, because that's like a, just a good segue. So like this shows that uh, fear of being punished 
is stronger than uh, love that a ruler may have for his people. Okay. Sometimes grammar doesn't want to work for me. All right. So anyway, you guys get the point here. So we have sat there and made a very, very strong argument just by following a formula. All right. So I obviously I put this all in um, in just kind of a format here. Um, but the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, um, what I want you guys to actually do, all right, is actually not put it like this and actually write it as in paragraph form, okay? So, I'm going to delete this part. All right, so if we were to read this whole entire thing again, we would say, yes, I agree with what Machiavelli says in his primary source. In quote number one, Machiavelli talks about how pain and punishment is a fear that all people have and will obey because of the fear. If a ruler loves their people, then the people will break that bond whenever they see fit. This shows that uh, fear of being punished is stronger than love that a ruler may have for his people. Okay, so, so much better of a um, argument there and just something really easy to do. All right, all you have to do is follow the ACE method. Okay, so whenever it says explain, that's what I want you guys to do. I want you to actually sit there and go through the ACE method. All right, answer the question, cite evidence, elaborate on how that evidence supports your answer. Okay, now the last question obviously doesn't have any explain, so you don't have to, you know, give the explanations that you have. All right, so do that now. I will see you guys all in five seconds to go over the last part. Okay, pause the video, do it. All right, so that will take us back to the Google Slides. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is another Renaissance man um, by the name of Mo Michelangelo. Okay, Michelangelo, not the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, but Michelangelo, the uh, painter, the sculptor, the writer. Um, and so um, I just want you guys to spend a little bit of time just, you know, um, just getting to know him. Okay, so this is going to be very, very simple here. All right, who is Michelangelo? How is the Sistine Chapel painted? What other works did Michelangelo be famous for and what makes the Sistine Chapel ceiling so famous? All right, once you do that, I want you to then put an image of either Michelangelo or you know the Sistine Chapels or something or other. Now you guys will notice that there are actually um, some uh, hyperlinks right here where it's the blue underlined stuff. So you guys can use that to actually uh, help yourself out when it comes to answering these questions. Okay, that's all I have for you guys to do today. I know I like went through it very, very quickly, but you guys can do it. I have the utmost faith in you. All right, again, if you guys have any questions, please let me know um, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So with that being said, I will see you guys all later.